Greetings, motherfuckers. I'm Sam, and today we're jetting across the proverbial pond to take a generous bite out of crime in New York City, alongside the everyday heroes in Brooklyn's 99th precinct. Yes, it's Brooklyn Nine-Nine. This feel-good buddy cop sitcom is delighted in millions with its kooky humor, lovable characters, and its outright refusal to be killed off by some lame studio bigwig who hates fun. You hear that? Brooklyn Nine-Nine gets cancelled when Brooklyn Nine-Nine wants to get cancelled, capiche? But which classic police comedy is referenced in the show's main titles? Which Brooklyn Nine-Nine cast member is heavier than Terry Crews thought they'd be? And hey, when's this movie happening? I haven't heard anything about a Nine-Nine movie, but I'm just putting it out there to the universe. Anyway, two out of three of those questions are going to be answered, so pull up a chair, grab yourself a healthy snack made of gummy bears wrapped in a fruit roll-up, breakfast burrito, and remember to never turn your back on Scar, as we crash headfirst into 101 facts about Brooklyn Nine-Nine. Number one. Brooklyn Nine-Nine is an American sitcom created by Dan Gore and Michael Schur. The series features Andy Samberg as the lovably childish yet talented NYPD detective and die-hard megafan Jake Peralta, along with his ragtag crew of colleagues who work together in Brooklyn's 99th precinct. And at the risk of sounding biased, it's a damn fine show. A damn fine show, I say. Number two. The show is made by sitcom sorcerers Michael Schur and Dan Gore, whose surnames are both just noises, by the way. The pair, who had previously collaborated on the celebrated love-lettered bureaucracy that is the wonderful Parks and Rec, both liked the idea of setting a comedy in a police station, as they both felt that such a setting had been underused in sitcoms. Number 3. Indeed, Schur and Gore originally pitched their idea for Brooklyn Nine-Nine as Parks and Recreation with Cops. Although NBC passed on the show, various other entertainment bigwigs scrambled violently over each other in their attempts to land it. Fox eventually emerged victorious, nabbing Brooklyn Nine-Nine for themselves before the scripts had even been written. Number 4. Sandberg originally wanted to take a break from television after spending seven years on the iconic American sketch show Saturday Night Live. However, he quickly changed his tune when Brooklyn Nine-Nine came along, and we're all so very glad he did. Number 5. Interestingly, actress Stephanie Beatrice initially auditioned for the role of Amy Santiago, which sounds weird to even say out loud, let alone actually think about and visualize. Just entertaining it as a concept gives me anxiety. Ugh. Okay, next fact. Number 6. When Stephanie Beatrice found out that Melissa Fumero had been cast as Amy Santiago, she cried because she was certain that the show's creators wouldn't cast two Latino women in the same show because of a little thing called racism. You may have heard of it. Number 7. Little did Beatrice know that the creators of Brooklyn Nine-Nine were more than happy to take on the actual Latina, thereby ending racism forever, for which we owe them a great debt of gratitude. After failing to bag Amy, Beatrice was invited to audition for the role of Rosa Diaz, a character who was, at the time, actually named Megan. Ugh. Number 8. Beatrice has stated that before booking her role in Brooklyn Nine-Nine, she was teaching workout classes to pay the bills and only had $50 in her bank account. A relatable story that makes me believe that one day I could become one of TV's most beloved characters. Just gotta start teaching workout classes. Number 9. Similarly, everyone's favorite Gina, Chelsea Peretti, originally auditioned for the role that eventually became Detective Rosa Diaz. Detective Rosa Diaz. Though the show's creators went in for a different, less white direction for the role, they loved Chelsea Peretti so much they created the part of Gina specifically for her. Number 10. Similarly, again, the character of Terry Jeffords also didn't exist during the casting process, and was written specifically for Terry Crews simply because they liked him so gosh darned much. And seriously, who can say no to a face like that? Don't want to pinch those cheeks so bad. Number 11. Indeed, the producers of Brooklyn Nine-Nine loved Cruise to such an extent, they basically ignored the very concept of fictional characters and turned the role into a heightened version of Cruise himself. Not only did they name the character after the actor that would be playing him, details like Terry's trusty minivan are based on Cruise too, who, shock horror, actually does choose to drive a minivan. Number 12. In fact, Brooklyn Nine-Nine's creators took this approach to all the main characters, though not to quite the same degree. Before Sher and Gore finished writing the pilot episode for Brooklyn Nine-Nine, they met with all the actors and attempted to work aspects of their personalities into their respective characters, in order to make them authentic and complex. Number 13. Sometimes these delicious little character details that make the characters on Brooklyn Nine-Nine so lovable and fun to watch emerge during filming itself. Apparently, Chelsea Peretti had a habit of laughing while the cameras were rolling. Sounds annoying. Which happened so often that eventually she stopped trying to muffle her cackles and the team just made it part of her character. Number 14. One delightful fact about Andy Samberg and Chelsea Peretti is that the pair went to the same elementary school, just as their characters did in the series. Usually it's a bad sign if you're in the same job as someone you knew in school, but in this case it's the kind of delightful celeb trivia that serves as this channel's very backbone. You two just need a bone. <laughs> what did you say? Your bone. BONE! BONE! Number 15. 
Scandalously, Chelsea Beretti has also revealed that she actually had a crush on Sandberg while they were at school together, which he apparently refuses to acknowledge at all. Oh, awkward. Number 16. Are you a mother factor with a love of trivia coming way out of left field? Good, because you're gonna like this one. Turns out Stephanie Beatriz is legally blind. Yes, she is in fact so nearsighted that she requires to wear very strong glasses to bring everything into focus. I can tell. And given that Rosa doesn't wear glasses and contact lenses irritate her eyes too much for her to wear them during long periods of time, Beatrice literally has to act while blind. Number 17. Not only did the cast get mined for their personality traits prior to filming, they also got put through their paces as trainee cops too. Before shooting commenced on Brooklyn Nine-Nine, the cast underwent police and firearm training as part of a boot camp run by the Glendale Police Department. Number 18. Though the show is primarily set in the mean streets of New York, it's shot almost entirely in the mean sound stages of Los Angeles. I know, I know, it all looks so real, that's the magic of Hollywood, baby. Number 19. The police station shown in the scene transitions, however, is very much located in New York. What's more, it's actually a real police station in Brooklyn for the 78th precinct, located on the corner of 6th Avenue and Bergen. Number 20. Interestingly enough, Andy Sandberg's first job in the entertainment industry was working as a production assistant on the show Spin City. Today, Brooklyn Nine-Nine films on the very same lot, a fact that Sandberg no doubt enjoys telling everyone who will listen. Well, I would anyway. Number 21. Dan Gore has stated that the production of Brooklyn Nine-Nine utilizes the services of a number of police advisors, who are present on set and at table reads to offer their expert advice. Indeed, he even consults with a college buddy of his who was a police officer in the NYPD for years, who Gore credits as an invaluable source of information. Number 22. <laughs> Gore has also revealed that when it comes to writing a season of Brooklyn Nine-Nine, the first six or so episodes are written during a 10-week pre-production period. Filming then commences and the rest are written as the show is being produced. Gore has stated succinctly that this process is, and I'm quoting him exactly here, very tiring. You know, that's tiring. Try working on one on one facts, Sonny Jim. It's an absolute madhouse back here. Number 23. Production on Brooklyn Nine Nine utilizes an interesting method of filming, in which each scene is shot a few times with the performers following the script verbatim, followed by a number of attempts at going off script and improvising in order to capture any hilarious off the cuff moments. This technique may sound familiar to you, and that's because it was also employed on the show's spiritual predecessor, Parks and Recreation. Number 24. The action figure at which Peralta stares at intensely during the show's opening titles depicts Police Academy character Kerry Mahoney, serving as an affectionate and subtle homage to the entire Police Academy franchise. Number 25. Kicking off the entire series is of course Brooklyn Nine-Nine's pilot episode, in which the team meet their new captain Raymond Holt for the very first time. When Holt, played exquisitely by Andre Brower, asks Terry to tell him about the squad, he first mentions that Scully, Hitchcock and Daniels are pretty much worthless but they make good coffee. Bizarrely, the female cop known as Daniels has never appeared on the show ever again. N uh... Number 26. However, Gore has revealed that Scully, Hitchcock and Daniels are named after three writers who he considers his heroes, Mike Scully, Norm Hiscock and Greg Daniels. Number 27. When Jake, Amy, Charles and Rosa are investigating the murder in the pilot episode, Holt sneaks up behind Jake without him knowing, prompting Jake to say sarcastically, Captain, hey, welcome to the murder. Gore has said that he and Sandberg thought up this line while filming the scene, and that it's one of his favourite lines in the entire show. Number 28. Oh, and it's also worth noting that the show's pilot episode was directed by none other than Phil Lord and Christopher Miller, the American filmmaking duo responsible for their work on a variety of acclaimed films, including the Lego Movie, 21 Jump Street and its sequel, 22 Jump Street, and possibly the coolest animated film in history, Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse. Number 29. During the cold open of the first season's second episode, entitled The Tagger, Holt castigates Jake for his sloppy paperwork and unkempt workspace, culminating in the revelation that Jake has a mouse living in his desk, which Jake calls Algonon. This is a reference to Flowers for Algonon, a short story written by American writer Daniel Keyes, in which a lab mouse with the same name undergoes surgery to increase its intelligence. Number 30. In the fourth episode of the first season, entitled M.E. Time, Terry fills in for the precinct's regular sketch artist who had to call in sick, but begins to take the role far too seriously. This is actually a rather delightful reflection of Terry Crews in real life, as his first job in entertainment was working as a sketch artist for a local news station. Crews has stated that his first assignment had him drawing up sketches for the worst murder case in the history of his hometown, of which he seems eerily proud. Number 31. 
In the cold open of the fifth episode of season one, entitled The Vulture, the gang are sharing stories about the oldest person they'd ever arrested. Arriving to the conversation late, Boyle assumes that they're talking about the oldest people they've, uh, smushed, admitting he got intimate with a 68-year-old woman while in his 20s. Apparently, actor Jolo Trulio was so funny while filming this scene that Jake's scandalized laughing response is actually Sandberg's genuine reaction as he fails to keep a straight face. Number 32. American comedian Patton Oswalt plays Fire Marshal Boone in the show, starting in the ninth episode of season one. The combination of his occupation and surname serves as a sneaky little ref to Marshal Boone, one of the show's producers. Number 33. The 14th episode of the first season, entitled The Ebony Falcon, is the first episode to put emphasis on Terry's passionate love of yogurt, or yogurt, I guess, with which I'm in complete yogurty agreement. It is in this episode that Terry first says his favorite third person catchphrase, Terry loves yogurt. But interestingly enough, this isn't the first time the line was uttered on the show. That honor belongs to Captain Holt, who utters the phrase after being given a police report that Deputy Commissioner Podolsky dumped in Terry's trash can, getting it covered in yogurt. Number 34. The Ebony Falcon is also the first episode in which we meet Terry's twin daughters, Cackney and Lacey, when Jake and Charles visit Terry at home to discuss a case. In case you didn't know, and for the sake of this fact, I'm going to assume you didn't know, Terry's twin daughters are named after the eponymously named lead characters in the 80s buddy cop drama Cackney and Lacey, which followed the story of two female partner detectives working in New York City. Number 35. The cold open of the 15th episode of the first season, entitled Operation Broken Feather, sees the 9-9 face off against their mortal enemies, the fire department, in a not-so-friendly game of hand egg, or American football or whatever you call it. The gang prevail against Marshall Boone and his colleagues, based entirely on the presence of human bulldozer Terry Jeffords. Once again, this draws on the real-life experiences of Mr. Terry Crews, who, in addition to being a former courtroom sketch artist, was also a professional footballer in the NFL. Honestly, Terry Crews may be one of the most interesting people alive today, apart from the angelic beam of divine and heavenly light that is Jennifer Lawrence, of course. <laughs> Number 36. During this episode, Boyle begins wearing a truly heinous fringe cream-colored leather jacket, which Terry concludes he must have gotten from the evidence locker. Later on, Boyle's jacket catches on fire, in what can only be described as a righteous judgment from the gods of fashion. And I should know, look at what I wear. Lo Trudio has since revealed that while filming the scene, the original plan was to set his arms on fire for real, but this proposal was shut down by the higher-ups who didn't want to imperil one of the show's main actors. Number 37. When Amy, Jake, and Terry get themselves trapped in Holt's bathroom in the 16th episode of the first season called The Party, Terry has to pick up Holt's adorable corgi cheddar in order to keep it away from Amy, who is allergic to dogs. Cruz has since stated that he was shocked over how heavy cheddar actually was, which is saying a lot for someone who looks like they bench press a Honda Civic. Number 38. Cheddar has been portrayed on screen by several dogs, but since early in season four, Cheddar has been played by an adorable corgi named Stuart. Sadly, Stuart passed away peacefully in 2019 at the ripe old age of 13, which is the equivalent, by the way, to almost 90 years of age in human years. He was a TV star after all. Number 39. Hey, remember a few facts ago when we talked about Terry having to fill in for a sickly sketch artist? Well, later in a scene from that episode, Amy has Terry produce a beautiful oil painting of Captain Holt, who says he wants to take the painting home for his husband, Kevin, who is played magnificently by Mark Evan Jackson. Eagle-eyed viewers will have noticed that in the episode The Party, Kevin has displayed the painting in his office. Did you notice this adorable detail first time round? Or were you in the dark before 101 Facts showed you the light? Let us know in our Snazzy YouTube poll. Number 40. The name of the restaurant to which the gang take Captain Holt and Kevin at the end of the episode is called Paretis, a clear nod to star Chelsea Peretti, who I think would run the best restaurant in history. Make it so, universe. Number 41. In the 19th episode of season one, called Tactical Village, Gina introduces Holt to a mobile phone game called Quasi Cupcakes, to which he becomes promptly addicted. If you fancy the taste of the game that even turned the great Raymond Holt into a dribbling iPhone holding zombie, you can actually give it a try, as a real life version of the app has been created by Red Games and is available to download for free. Hashtag no spawn. The meaning of life. Hey, another thing to note about this episode. It's the first time anyone chants 9-9. Legend has it that Terry Crews started doing this chant to motivate the cast on set, because Terry Crews is just the best. The writers like that so much, they then put it in the show. Number 43. During the scene at the stationery store in the 20th episode of season one, entitled Fancy Brudgom, Charles and Jake discuss how to bring up the fact that he doesn't want to move to Canada with his soon-to-be wife, Vivian. The employee helping Charles with his paper choices is played by actress Beth Dover, who is the wife of a certain Jolo Trulio. At the time of filming, the pair were actually engaged and got married just over a month later. Number 44. The sixth episode of season two, entitled Jake and Sophia, begins with the gang speculating on what possible reason the fastidiously punctual Amy could have for being late to work. When Amy finally arrives, a pitiful 70 seconds late, I should add, and confirms that Holt was correct that the delay was caused by a problem at the bank, he exclaims emphatically, Hot damn! 
Get this, by the way, that hot damn, totally improvised. I know, I know, mind blown. Number 45. This episode also premieres Eva Longoria as Sofia Perez, Jake's girlfriend throughout much of the second season who he dates to get over Amy Santiago. Incidentally, in 2018, Longoria gave birth to a son who she named Santiago. Coincidence? Almost certainly. But you try writing over 100 facts on a different topic every week without including any fluff. Not as easy as it seems, Sonny Jim, it's an absolute madhouse back here. Number 46. The 12th episode of season 2, entitled Beach House, sees the gang struggle to keep morale high at their group getaway with Dollar's Dishwasher Halt bringing the vibe down. Chelsea Baretti has stated that this episode was one of the most difficult to get through without laughing, as Andre Brower's excruciating delivery of Halt's boring banter kept her cracking up. Number 47. Way back in the 12th episode of season 1, entitled The Pontiac Bandit, guest starring the spellbinding Craig Robinson in the title role, Holt gifts an injured boil with two adorable little puppies. Many episodes later, in the 13th episode of season 2, entitled Payback, Boyle appears with his pair of doggos who are doggos no more, all grown up into two fully grown dogs. Number 48. The 23rd episode of season 2, entitled Johnny and Dora, is notable as the first episode in which Jake and Amy finally stop falling around and suck face. Turns out the pair's first on-screen kiss wasn't all that sweet, as both Sandberg and Fumero try to one-up each other by eating wings and roasted garlic to make the smooch as disgusting as possible. Number 49. In the premiere episode of season 3, Jake and Amy attempt to date normally after keeping their relationship secret from the rest of the team. The restaurant where they go on their super awkward first official date is called Bouche Manger, two French words which literally translate to mouth eat. Fancy swanchy. Number 50. Just after Gina informs Captain Holt that his arch nemesis Madeline Wunch has come to see him, she blithely mentions that her ideal job would be that of a bullfighter, before lamenting it's such a boys club. Later on, in the fifth episode of season 3 entitled Halloween 3, the gang dress up for Halloween in order to torment Charles, who arrives work sans costume out of annoyance that none of the others ever dress up for the holiday and actually make fun of him for doing so. The reason I mention this, well, because look at what costume Gina's wearing. That's right, a bullfighter. Number 51. In the fourth episode of season 3, entitled The Oolong Slayer, major crimes detective and major douchebag Keith Pembroke, better known as the Vulture, forces Rosa and Amy to plan his birthday party. At one point in the episode, Rosa refers to the Vulture, played by actor Dean Winters, as a dummy. This could be a subtle nod to the acclaimed sitcom 30 Rock, in which Winters plays Dennis, one of Liz Lemon's boyfriends who repeatedly refers to her as dummy. Number 52. When Amy visits Jake's mother in the 14th episode of season 3, entitled Karen Peralta, the pair discuss his father's reappearance in his mother's life in his childhood bedroom. If you look closely, there's a poster in his bedroom door that has the words Hot Rod on it. This is likely a reference to the 2007 movie of the same name in which Andy Samberg starred as an amateur stuntman desperate for his father's approval. Number 53. In what may turn out to be the most esoteric detail we've ever dug up on 101 Facts, the Finnish word for darkness, which can describe Adrian's mental state, but also refers to a place that is undercover, is pimento. I know, right? Always one step ahead, those pesky Finns. Number 54. Throughout the third season, Melissa Fumero created unnecessary headaches for the show's producers by very inconsiderately becoming pregnant. <sighs> As it was decided not to write the pregnancy into the show, the crew had to come up with a number of fun and creative ways to hide her growing munchkin mound. <laughs> These included dressing for Mero in large billowy tops, sitting her behind desks, or having her carry large bags in front of her so as not to ruin the inscrutable magic of TV sitcoms. Number 55. In the third season's final three episodes, Amy spends time working undercover as a pregnant inmate in a prison, allowing her to appear in the show as visibly prego without the use of various baby bump barriers. This is alluded to in the show with a joke when Jake and Charles are assessing her fake pregnancy belly and asking if she looks believably with child, when in fact, she was quite literally with child. Number 56. Andre Brower has stated in interviews that he actually keeps track of the number of times he breaks character by laughing while filming, in an effort to make sure he breaks as little as possible. Brower reveals he only broke character a total of 13 times while filming season 3, up from only 8 times in season 2. Get your act together, Brower, your standards are slipping, man. Number 57. When Charles is preparing to slaughter the turkey in the seventh episode of season four, entitled Mr. Santiago, he walks in clad in a full body kill suit and gleefully remarks that he feels like the eponymously named forensic technician serial killer from the show Dexter, which genuinely was one of my favorite shows of all time and then has the worst ending in the history of television. No, I'm not over it. Anyway, funnily enough, this episode sees the series debut of Amy's father, Victor Santiago, portrayed by actor Jimmy Smits, who also appeared throughout Dexter's third series as assistant district attorney Miguel Prado. Number 58. 
Joe Lodrudio has stated that his favourite moment in the whole series is a scene in the 15th episode of season 4, entitled The Last Ride, in which it looks like the 9-9 is to be shut down. Boyle and Jake go on one last steakhouse together, no, it's not steakhouse, stakeout together, and have to hide their tears from each other by covering their eyes with binoculars. Lotrulio has stated that he loves this hilarious yet nonetheless touching scene because it shows two guys getting real together, and that he believes it's important to show affection. Number 59. As previously mentioned, many of the things that Terry goes through in the show come from real-life experiences of the actor portraying him, Mr. Teddy Cruz. While this previously manifested as Terry's myriad talents for courtroom sketch artistry or dominating sports-wise, sadly the same applies to some of Terry's less whimsical moments. Like most black people, Cruz has experienced racism and racial profiling for real, which prompted the narrative of the 16th episode of season 4 entitled Moo Moo, in which Terry is racially profiled by a white cop while off duty. The guy who profiles him, by the way, is also an ex-Dexter man, Desmond Harrington, who plays Quinn. Number 60. While Jake and Captain Holt are sequestered in Florida at the start of the season due to the small matter of them being targeted for murder by Jimmy the Butcher Figgis, Holt's replacement at the 9-9 is the laughably incompetent Captain Jason C.J. Stentley, who rules over the remaining members of the gang with a concerningly childlike obliviousness. Regardless, C.J. still manages to leave his mark on the 9-9 after he leaves, in that his bongos can be seen on display in Holt's office following his departure. And yes, I did say bongos. Test me, I'll say it again. Bongos. Number 61. Season 5 begins with Rosa and Jake in prison, having been framed by the corrupt lieutenant, Melanie Hawkins. The prison in which the scenes were filmed is actually an abandoned jail located just outside Los Angeles, which is now mostly used by the entertainment industry whenever a prison environment is required. Number 62. In the fourth episode of season 5, entitled Halloween, get it because it's the fifth. Halloween. The most observant Brooklyn Nine-Nine superfans may have spotted an adorable photo of Amy and Jake on Amy's desk. This photo is actually an on-set snap taken by Melissa Romero herself, which was posted to her personal Instagram. Number 63. In the ninth episode of season 5, entitled Nine-Nine, Rosa reveals to Charles that she is bisexual, a move inspired by Stephanie Beatrice, who is a genuine bona fide bisexual herself. Beatrice suggested that the writers incorporate this part of her life into Rosa, which they happily obliged. Nintendo 64. In addition to the commendable decision to have Rosa come out as bisexual, further widening the scope of media representation for the LGBTQ community, this episode also features a guest appearance from the show's co-creator Dan Gore, who provided the haunting sounds of the cow loving that can be heard while the gang is staying with the Texas Boils. Of course, any halfway decent bovine enthusiast would have figured that out already. The sound of real cattle canoodling is far more disturbing than that. Number 65. In the 15th episode of season 5, entitled The Puzzle Master, Jake and Amy work together on a case involving Amy's celebrity crush, the hunky crossword puzzle author Melvin Sturmley, immediately igniting Jake's jealousy and insecurity. As it happens, Sturmley is portrayed in this episode by David Pomero, Melissa Pomero's real life hubby. Number 66. In the 22nd episode of season 5, called Jake and Amy, actress Gina Rodriguez stars as a romantic interest for Rosa, in the form of an attractive Uber driver named Alicia. Beatrice and Rodriguez are in fact real-life friends, and Rodriguez actually gave up her vacation in order to shoot the scenes for the episode. What a couple of stone-cold besties. Number 67. Of course, fans of Brooklyn Nine-Nine will be painfully aware that following the conclusion of the fifth season, Fox foolishly decided it would be a good idea to cancel the show like the filthy pack of animals they are. When news of this sickening crime against TV went public, fans of the show responded with outrage, demanding that the show be saved. Number 68. Amongst those protesting against the cancellation of Brooklyn Nine-Nine and calling for its salvation were a number of prominent celebrities, including Star Wars legend Mark Hamill, Lord of the Rings legend Sean Astin, monster-making legend Guillermo del Toro, and even schmaltzy boy band legends the Backstreet Boys. That's a lot of legends. A league of legends, if you will. Yeah? Number 69. When all this was going on, the cast of Brooklyn Nine-Nine took refuge together in a WhatsApp group chat, allowing them to keep abreast of the situation as the scare unfolded. Cruz described the cancellation appropriately, saying it felt like a family splitting up and prompted great sadness. Number 7 T. Luckily, less than 24 hours after Fox's gargantuan lapse in judgement, NBC decided to be the only adults in the room by picking up the series for a sixth season, with the original intention to give the show one last season and a proper finale. However, the show's ratings and reception were better than expected, and NBC later renewed the show for a seventh season. Number 71. Following the madness of Brooklyn Nine-Nine's terrifying cancellation scare and the subsequent move to NBC, the show began its much praised sixth season in January of 2019. With season 6, Brooklyn Nine-Nine began to feature the occasional instance of strong language, which was bleeped out for comic effect. As everyone knows, swear words makes everything funnier, mother chuffers. Number 72. The eighth episode of season 6, called He Said, She Said, features a difficult case inspired by the Me Too movement, in which a woman who injured her boss in his 
bit, claims she only did so because he was trying to attack her. The original plan for the episode was for it to have a sunnier ending, but this was challenged by the cast, who pushed for a more difficult conclusion. Number 73. In the 16th episode of the 6th season called Cinco de Mayo, Terry gets painted entirely in gold over the course of the madcap Cinco de Mayo heist. Cruz has stated that filming while covered in gold paint wasn't a particularly pleasant, as it turned out he was allergic to the clothes he had to wear. Ever the professional, Cruz maintained that despite the adverse reaction, the joke was worth it. Number 74. Interestingly enough, if you go back and rewatch the sixth season, you may notice that Jake and Amy never kiss at any point. Made aware of this strange lack of snogging, oh, that's just the worst word, isn't it? Gore concluded that mistakes were made. Indeed. Let's hope for a return to face sucking form in season seven. Number 75. Curiously, the title of each season finale has been made up of two words conjoined by the ampersand or the word and. This all ended, however, with the finale of season 6, which forewent the usual naming convention and is instead entitled The Suicide Squad, a title that is, frankly, triggering. Number 76. Oh, and you know that deep husky voice that says Tremulon at the end of each episode? That's Nick Offerman, who incidentally also starred as Holt's gruff ex boyfriend Frederick in season 3's Thanksgiving episode entitled Eva. But you already knew that, didn't you? You'd recognise those warm, rustic vocals anywhere. We all would. Number 77. Jake's nervous habit of repeatedly saying cool began as an onset goof that Sandberg would employ when he wanted to make his fellow cast members laugh between takes. Clearly, the show's producers liked it as it was soon added to Jake's repertoire and has since become a signature line from the show. Cool, cool no cool. doubt. Number 78. Despite the inclusion of multiple jokes made about Amy being a terrible dancer, Melissa Fumero is actually a professionally trained dancer and even taught a ballet class as one of her first jobs. Number 79. Characters in the show can occasionally be seen eating Let's Potato Chips, a fictional brand manufactured by ISS Props House. It's also appeared in other TV shows too, including Community, It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia, Orange is the New Black, New Girl, and Arrested Development. Number 80. Certain viewers in the know may have noticed that Captain Holt wears a WTC breast bar on his shirt. What does this mean? Well, it indicates he was working on 9 11. Number 81. Several episodes of Brooklyn Nine-Nine have been directed by Sandberg's Lonely Island comrades Jorma Tacconi and Akiva Schaefer. Tacconi directed the 10th episode of Season 1 entitled Thanksgiving, while Schaefer directed both the Season 1 finale, Charges and Specs, and the 15th episode of Season 5, The Puzzle Master. Number 82. Not only that, both have also guest starred in the show. Tacone appeared as Taylor, the air-headed manager of the entertainment center Frank's Fun Zone, where Jake and Captain Holter employed while they're stuck in Florida, while Schaefer portrayed Brett Booth, a detective at the 63rd Precinct who has held the grudge against Jake ever since he accidentally shot Booth in the eye during a training exercise, which obviously seriously degraded his depth perception. Number 83. In the 15th episode of Season 3, Damon Wyans Jr. guest stars as Stevie Shillens, a detective at the 98th Precinct who was Jake's very first partner way back when they were beat cops. Given that Zooey Deschanel also guest stars in the fourth episode of season four called The Night Shift, That's on me, I set the bar too low. In which she reprises her role as Jess from the Fox sitcom New Girl, which also stars Wyans as a series regular, Wyans has therefore played two different characters in two different series that exist in the same universe. Number 84. On set, Lo Trudio is affectionately known as Butt McGee, which sounds like something a bully would call the dorky main character in an American family film from the 90s. But apparently it actually does make sense. According to Sandberg, the joke at the end of the scene is called a button, which led the cast to refer to Lotrudio as Butt McGee, because he didn't know when to stop riffing during a scene and always trying to add one more at the end. Number 85. Interestingly enough, Terry Crews and Sandra Bernhardt, who portrays Gina Linetti's mother Darlene, are both from the same town of Flint, Michigan, that place where the politicians poison the water because it was cheaper. Remember that? That was messed up, wasn't it? Still not completely fixed, I don't think. Oh well, back to the fun stuff. Number 86. Dan Gore has suggested that the actor who is most like their character is probably Terry, which isn't super surprising considering they mix genuine Terry Crews facts to bring Sergeant Jeffords to life on the big screen. Number 87. Conversely, Gore believes that of all the show's cast members, Stephanie Beatriz is the least similar to her character, which is unsurprising considering the fact that Rosa went to medical school for three years, has a pilot's license, and is known to carry large knives with her at all times. Number 88. Indeed, Beatrice has stated in interviews that she is so different to her character that fans often don't fully recognize her, often suggesting that she only kind of looks like Rosa Diaz. Beatrice has said on numerous occasions that when she replied that she is in fact the actress who plays Rosa on the show, people have flat out disagreed with her. Number 89. The show is known for its highly entertaining Halloween specials, in which the entire gang essentially play an incredibly convoluted yet hilariously entertaining games of Catch the Flag, despite the fact they are on-duty police officers in one of the planet's busiest cities. Interestingly, the cast doesn't actually know who's going to win until filming commences, which sounds both delightfully fun and logistically inconvenient. 
Number 90. Many of the props used in the production of Brooklyn Nine-Nine are actually old props from Parks and Rec. And presumably when Shur and Gore work their magic on whatever hilarious show they cook up next, it too will feature props from Brooklyn Nine-Nine. Maybe CJ's bongos will end up in someone else's office in years to come. Number 91. For obvious reasons, Gore has stated that his dream guest star would be Bruce Willis, who would presumably star as himself in a scene in which Jake spontaneously combusts out of sheer joy from meeting the star of the greatest film ever made. Die Hard. Come on, someone pull some strings. Let's get it to happen. Number 92. Gore has stated that his favourite Brooklyn Nine-Nine cold open occurs at the beginning of the third episode of the third season, called Boyle's Hunch, in which Jake adopts a tarantula that was seized after busting a drug dealer. Aside from the fact that the large arachnid escapes and manages to end up on top of Terry's head, Gore loves the scene for the various nicknames that Jake produces for his new partner, which includes Spidey Klum, Tarantula Bassett, and Joe Spiden. Number 93. The cold open that Mr. Terry Crews most favours is from the beginning of the fourth episode of season four called The Night Shift, in which the gang attempt to forcibly remove the glorious frosted tips that Jake had acquired in his time in Florida. Crews says that no matter how many times he's watched it, the scene never fails to make him laugh. Number 94. Andy Samberg, Jolo Trudio, Stephanie Beatriz, and Jason Mantoukas have all provided voices on the hit animated TV series Bob's Burgers. Sandberg voices Brett, one of Tina's many love interests. Lo Trudio voices several characters on the show, including Bryce, Carl Lumpkin, and Scab. Beatrice voiced Julia and Chloe Barbash. And Manzoukas lent his distinctive vocals to Mr. Manoogian, the owner and operator of the Sand Flea Motel. Number 95. Andy Sandberg. Being one of the only spots of light and whimsy in an ever more ugly and depressing world, Brooklyn Nine-Nine has obviously nabbed itself its fair share of awards and accolades. These include Emmys and Golden Globes for the show as a whole, as well as a Golden Globe for Andy Samberg and a Critics' Choice Television Award for Andre Brower. Number 96. Not only that, Brooklyn Nine-Nine has also won a GLAAD Media Award for its positive portrayal of LGBTQ plus people, specifically Captain Holt, his husband Kevin, and Rosa Diaz. Who knew it was possible to write lovable yet complex queer characters that don't descend into lazy stereotypes and cheap jokes? LGBTQ plus people, that's who. Number 97. The cast and crew have revealed a few details about what fans can expect to see in subsequent seasons of Brooklyn Nine-Nine, giving us tantalizing tastes of episodes to come. One such idea that has existed since season one but has not yet worked into the show involves the simple premise that Jake loves honey mustard. Look forward to that, mega fans. Number 98. The writers have also debated expanding on Rose's mysterious backstory. They do, however, note that the fantasy of her enigmatic life may be funnier than the actual reality of it. Number 99. However, one episode that the team have talked about doing for years involves Holt and Kevin renewing their vows, an idea that Mark Evan Jackson apparently likes to bring up at every possible opportunity. Number 100. You may also remember that in the first ever episode of the show, Terry mentions that Amy has not one, not two, but seven brothers. While we've met one of Amy's bros in the form of David Santiago, played by Lin-Manuel Miranda, Gore has stated that there are plans to introduce more of Amy's siblings. Number 101. One thing that is confirmed out season 7 is that it will feature another installment of the Jimmy Jab Games, the enthralling Office Olympics event that was last seen all the way back in season 2. So that was 101 facts about Brooklyn Nine-Nine. Is it one of your favourite shows ever? Do you love it? Do you really love it? Let me know in the comments down below. Also, be sure to give this video a like and subscribe to 101 Facts if you haven't done so already, because all the cool kids have done it, baby. In the meantime, two videos on the screen now for you. One of them is going to oh, just solve all the problems in your life. Don't believe me? Well, try it out then, and I'll see you there.